to the Birth Boot Camp podcast. I'm Holly Hopley, the CEO. And I'm Megan Busk, the head of marketing. And today we are super excited. Um, we have, this is a topic we have not talked about on the podcast before. We're going to be talking about the NICU experience. And we have Mary Ferrelli. I should have asked you, is that how you pronounce your name? It's Ferrelli, <laughs> but Ferrelli works too. It's okay, Irish, cool. not Italian. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I should have asked, sorry. <laughs> um, but will you take just a minute and briefly introduce yourself, kind of tell us who you are and what you do and kind of how you got into this? Sure. Uh, so my name is Mary Farrelly. I am a certified NICU nurse. I've worked in level four NICUs for the past 11 years. Um, I also have served in other roles in the NICU, such as nurse educator, um, charge nurse team leads. I've worn many hats and I'm also a mom of two littles. And I founded and started a business called the NICU Translator. It's um, not quite a year old, but it's almost a year old, um, where I help bridge the gap between the NICU and home. So, so many families um, have 24-7 nursing care, people there at, to answer their questions, continuous monitoring, maybe a little bit of a heightened anxiety level with having their baby in the NICU in the first place. And then discharge days comes, which is super exciting, but they're just like, okay, here's your baby. Off you go. Good luck. And not the, the NICU experience can really just change people's whole perspective on their, on their parenting journey. And also their baby probably has some unique needs that maybe don't quite fit the mold of like a regular newborn. So to kind of bridge the gap between those two worlds, I started the NICU translator and I connect families um, with support and resources, both through one-on-one -on -one services. So I work one-on-one -on -one with families and kind of guide them for those like first six to eight weeks home. I also am building a, um, online community where people can connect with each other and also get their questions answered by other professionals such as PT, OT, speech, all those other people that you might have in your world. And I just like to hang out on Instagram and kind of bring some awareness to the NICU and make it feel less scary and make people who experience it feel less alone. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that is something that is like so needed. I have a sister <gasps> who had a baby in the NICU for a long time and I just think it's something that is so needed. So I love that. Like when I, I remember when I, you, you posted in a Facebook group, I think was how we kind of got connected. And I was like, oh, we need to talk about this. So I love that. That's it's, awesome. It's, it's funny because the NICU is not really, you know, it's not talked about too much, but there's always, when you do bring it up, people always know somebody who experienced mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's always, it's there. And it's, it's not as uncommon as people think, which I feel like sometimes just knowing that can decrease that like stigma and overwhelm and stress and kind of as much as the NICU is not normal, kind of normalize the experience so that right. it doesn't have that like kind of long lasting mm -hmm. negative impact. Yeah. I love how, um, like you think it should be included in like childbirth education, um, which we don't really have it very much in ours. And I was like, well, I guess we need to, we need to change that. Um, because I think even if just addressing it, um, mm -hmm. because, and hopefully none of our clients will have that, but you know what, that's going to happen to some mm -hmm. people. And so when we can kind of give them the, just the basics to kind of get them started, um, so that it's not so scary if their baby does mm -hmm. need to go into the NICU. Um, so if you, if you were to add it into classes, like, what do you think would be good to include? I, so I am kind of like on a mission to kind of put like one drop of NICU in every like, childbirth education. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Just one little piece because it, it is, you know, having gone through multiple pregnancies myself, I know that there's this heightened sense of anxiety anyways. Mm -hmm. So there, I don't want people to have this like to like increase anxiety and be like, OK, well, you know, like the doomsday scenario is going to happen. But there are so many, so many reasons that NICU can be a part of your story. And the statistic is it's it's one in every 10 babies born in the U.S. will require a NICU stay. So it's, okay. it's fairly. That's more fairly than I common. thought. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, like 450,000 babies this year will be in the NICU. It might be for an hour. It could be for five days, five weeks, five months. Um, so in terms of what I think it would be helpful to know is just that basically that statistic that like. It is possible that this could be a part of your birth story. Being born is is hard. Like you go from living in this wonderful bubble where everything's done for you and then you're out in the real world and you have to breathe and eat and pee and poop and do all these things that you didn't have to do really 
by yourself. And some babies need extra support transitioning from inside life to outside life. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're there. We're there to kind of be that bridge between intrauterine life and life outside in the real world. Right. Um, so I think just some basics that could be helpful to know to think about prenatally are asking yourself a few questions. Like if the NICU is part of my experience, do I know which NICU that would be? Like where in my area are the NICUs? What level of acuity are there? So the NICU is kind of a broad term. Um, there's level one, which is basically like a, a, a well baby nursery with a little bit of support level two, level three, and level four. So some babies, even if your hospital has like a level two NICU, could require transfer to a level four. So in that scenario, I think if that does happen, it always, almost always catches people totally off guard, but knowing who you would want to stay with you, who would you want to go with baby, and how do you kind of like divide and conquer those needs if mom and baby do need to be separated. So rather than scrambling and trying to figure that out last minute, you kind of would be like, okay, we already talked about this. Like, you know, my doula would stay with me. Dad would go with the baby or I'm comfortable. It, it, there's lots of different scenarios there, but just having that kind of in the back of your head, knowing which Nick you would go to, and then maybe having like a basic idea of some very general diagnoses that are the most common ones in the NICU. Um, so that would be prematurity. So any baby born less than 37 weeks is technically considered premature and may require some extra support. They don't necessarily, like if you have a 36 week delivery, it doesn't mean you're definitely in the NICU, but it can be, um, they may need a little bit of help just transitioning. Respiratory distress is the most common. So that is just basically needing a little extra support to wake up their lungs and stop being a fish in the water and <laughs> breathe air. Um, and that can look different, different scenarios depending on how old the baby is and what they look like. But that's a common one. Um, and then jaundice. So some babies just need a little extra help getting out of that bilirubin that can build up after delivery. Low blood sugar, especially if mom has a history of type 1 or type 2 or gestational diabetes. And then some type of a birth event can sometimes lead to needing a little bit extra monitoring in the NICU. So those are just like the common scenarios that come up. So just having the bare minimum understanding of that and having maybe some of those questions built into your birth plan can kind of mm -hmm. alleviate that catastrophe if it does feel right. like if it does happen. Right. I love that. Like our whole goal is to make sure that our, our couples and our moms are feeling prepared and confident. And that is just something that we don't often consider as far as like, I need to plan and prepare and ask questions about that, this, um, if, if in fact it does happen. So I love those suggestions. Mm -hmm. you don't want it to happen. And you want to be able to like write it down mm -hmm. and then seal it up in an envelope and be like, okay, I thought about it. No, I don't yeah, think yeah about exactly. It. <laughs> That's what I tell them. Like we have our, like our best laid plans, but like, mm -hmm. let's just talk about like, you know, plan B, C, D, E, like just in case, because mm -hmm. yeah, but it's like, okay, we just have to pull this plan out of our back pocket. Right. And in the like, moment your adrenaline's rushing, you might be in mm -hmm. pain. Like you're not making decisions that are coming from a place of knowledge and understanding you're kind of in that right. fight or flight um, mm -hmm. yeah and so you want to be able to just regroup and also having people in your life that also know what your preferences and decisions are so then they can advocate for you even if you are separated from your baby so mm -hmm. what your feeding preferences are any pieces of your birth plan and what you wanted to have immediately post delivery a lot of pieces of those can still happen maybe in a slightly different way but still kind of be incorporated in the NICU stay too so mm -hmm. having someone that can communicate that with the NICU team because we don't see birth plans like we're kind of in our own right. Yeah, bubble. But there yeah. are definitely pieces of it that can still be implemented inside yeah. of NICU. Can you talk about kind of what those pieces are? Sure. Um, so one of the big things that um, comes up in the NICU is establishing early breastfeeding. Um, sometimes babies, depending on what their reason for mission is, are not able to take anything by mouth. So they would be called MPO, which is nothing by mouth. And that's basically to give either their belly a chance to kind of relax or their breathing a chance to catch up before they're breastfeeding mm -hmm. or um, eating it really anything by mouth. So those babies may have an IV or they might have a feeding tube in, which sounds scary, but it's very, it's just like a, basically like a straw that bypasses their need to suck and puts the food in their belly. But because of that, mom's with babies in the NICU kind of forget about the fact that 
during that time is when they would be establishing like skin to skin and those early latches. So getting together with somebody who can set you up with early, early pumping is key mm -hmm. and pumping with purpose and kind of uh, a plan of like, okay, if this, if my baby were here, this is what we would be doing. So then you can still start establishing that early milk supply. So when you are reconnected with your baby and they're able to latch, you're not kind of starting from scratch. Cause you mm -hmm. know, as we all know with in the trunk work, right. those, those early hours are super important. Yeah. And then communicating that with the NICU team. So saying like mom's goal is to breastfeed. Um, depending on the diagnosis, sometimes they will require especially if it's like a low blood sugar, some early feeding, but a lot of NICUs have donor milk too. So mm -hmm. if your mom's milk supply is not matching with the, the immediate sugar needs of the baby, you can advocate for that. Um, and then kind of some babies cannot in the initially skin to skin. Many, 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 many of them can. There's a, there's a few reasons why you couldn't do it in the first early hours, but it might not be immediately after delivery, but we can get your baby out and on your body even the tiny, tiny micros pretty early on in their NICU stay. So mm -hmm. saying like, I, I really like, sometimes you have to ask because as a NICU nurse, you're kind of in that like task world sometimes in the early yeah. admission. Right. And if someone's just saying, Hey, I would really love when, when can we do skin to skin? Like let's set mm -hmm. a time for that mm -hmm. and get them out to have that experience. So yeah. have them on. And in the meantime, another like super easy thing to do is not necessarily part of the birth plan, but our scent hearts. So having like, oh, either it can be, it's just like a birth cloth that you have with mom has their scent and you put it in the, with the baby and then the baby's blanket goes with mom. And it's just this like exchange of mm -hmm. smells and hormones yeah. and things the like that. Yeah. All, that, that, all kind that of, goodness. All the goodness can kind of <laughs> yeah. mimic that. And some NICUs, um, those are three things that almost universally every NICU will have. Every mm -hmm. NICU has their own little policies and protocols, but right well that. and it's good to know Sorry. that they can like ask for that mm -hmm. you know because yeah. I think if if you don't know to ask then you know you just have no idea so I think that's that's really yeah. helpful um the, the NICU is kind of a bizarre world in that the autonomy from parents is basically kind of like completely reversed mm -hmm. um and because there's fear and anxiety around it a lot of parents don't even think to ask certain things as right. you said so it is helpful to kind of know that you are still the parent, you still know your baby best and your wishes and your desires are still super important. Well, balancing that with like the medical care your baby needs to transition and get on out of the NICU. Right. <laughs> so you don't want right. to keep them longer than they need to. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. What do you yeah. think are some of like the biggest challenges that a family faces um, when their baby is in the NICU? I think a few a few things come to mind. One of the biggest ones is um, fear of the unknown. So a lot of, as you said, as I said before, it's one in 10, but most of those babies are not, you don't know that prenatally. There's no, like, sometimes people will have an idea based on something that came up prenatally that your baby may need the, the NICU, but also prenatal and OB teams kind of are notorious for maybe not mentioning it also yeah. too. Like it just doesn't always come up. So there's just a lot of, a lot of fear coming from a place of lack of knowledge. Um, and we do our best in the NICU to catch people up super quick. And a lot of times people leave the NICU and I feel like they could be a NICU nurse too, because they're just like really, <laughs> really, mm -hmm. really into that. Um, yeah, that's how like my absorbing the ways. Like she yeah, can do you, all you, the things. you can do all, and we want, we want you to do all the things. Like, yeah. like I'm not taking your baby home. You yeah. are. So as much as you can, like bringing the normal parenting experience back in, because a lot of families feel like out of control because they have to ask when to touch their babies. Basically, they have no autonomy over a lot of the care that is provided. And then when discharge does finally come, there's they've been in fight or flight for however long the baby was in the NICU, and they maybe didn't have time to process like how the actual fear. So a lot of moms, I feel like I see switch right into like, like super mom mode, basically like, like, okay, this mm -hmm. is, this is what we're doing. Like, okay, let's, let's do this. Like mm -hmm. you don't have a choice, right? Like this right. is your baby and you're, this is the situation you're in. But then I also see them come home and things kind of slow down a little bit. And then all of those like super intense feelings 
come flooding back and they're like, mm -hmm. whoa, like I did not, I thought we were fine. Like we, we got this, we had this. And that can really be very hard for families that are at a higher rate of having postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, and being readmitted because NICU families tend to just like, again, hyper-focus on their baby and their baby's needs, and they totally forget themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of, sometimes moms will need to be readmitted into the emergency room because they just were not allowing themselves to have that postpartum healing because they're just yeah, focused that makes on sense. the health. It yeah. does, totally. I mean, as yeah. a parent, I get that 100%. So people that are in their lives that can be like a little bit more objective and like look back and see what's happening, I feel like that can be super helpful for them to be like, make it easy for them to take care of themselves. Like mm -hmm. even more so than a, than a, it's hard being postpartum, no matter what right. being postpartum and separate from your baby. still having this adrenaline and fear, like people just ideally need to just like, you know, shove food in their mouth and yeah. Like, wash her yeah. at the bedside and yeah, take right. care of the parents as much as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that that, that feeling may come later that like overwhelm and maybe having like a kind of a plan in place for how you would address it. So sometimes with families, I'll in the NICU, I'll say like, Hey, like you're, you're doing great right now. Like you're, you're crashing it, but I want you to know that like this could happen. So maybe think about with your partner, like what you would do if you're starting mm -hmm. to have these like really kind of overwhelming intense feelings that are impacting your ability to function. So like yeah, knowing who right. you would call and knowing resources can be really helpful to not trying to again trying to figure it out as you go having like mm -hmm. a pitch of preparedness for that yeah can go a long way I think that's a great tip and I feel like there's there's probably a lot of things that like people on the outside looking in can can help with as so like aside from like feeding mom and you know making sure that she's clothed and helping her throughout her postpartum like whenever I've had friends who've had babies in the NICU I'm like what can I do to help support you during this time, because I just feel helpless, you know? So what are some tips that you have for like those, those people? Sure. Um, I think a, a big piece of it is watching the things that you say, because a lot of things are said possibly with like very, very pure, very positive intent, but can be interpreted really, um, negatively a lot of NICU families already have this underlying lever layer of like feelings of shame and guilt and disappointment um so anyone that says like well at least you can go home and sleep or like any of those like at least like yeah, at least your baby's like okay at least yeah. this at least that those are not helpful mm. um so what they really whatever I heard for the most part is people just really want to be like here like I'm so sorry this sucks I would love to bring you food. I would love to walk your dog. I would love to do your laundry. Um, we're here for you. And also a lot of times families feel kind of burdened by having to give updates to people all the time. So even if you message someone and say like, hey, I just want you to know that like I'm thinking of you. I don't need an update right now. If you want to share with me, that's great. I'm just, I'm here. I'm here if you need me and I'm sending you a DoorDash gift certificate too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can be huge. And just, or if you are super close to that family, be like, can I be your update point person? So you tell me what's going on with you. If they want to share, you tell me and I will tell our extended family and our support system. So mm -hmm. they can just sit there. They just want to be there and be in the moment as much as mm -hmm. possible. So having protecting their bubble can be like really, really helpful depending on like how close you are with the NICU family. Um, but it always being mindful of, of how you're wording things and um, remembering that their baby is not going to probably follow a typical well baby course. So when you're offering advice and suggestions, um, doing it from a place of, of curiosity. Like, I know that this might be different for your baby. This is something that worked for mine, but like, I know that your baby might do something differently. Cause I hear that also is that sometimes families and friends are like, well, this is how I fed my baby. And this is what I did with that. And they're yeah. like, okay, that's great. But my baby is different. Like we have a diagnosis or they're really small or there's something going on with feeding or breathing. And like, I can't, I have to focus yeah. in on like 
what works for brides. So that's just something, some little pieces to think about when you're helping a family, but I really love just that. not being scared to give them space to talk to mm -hmm. and to be either super happy and excited. Cause there are some amazing moments in the NICU. Like the NICU can be like the most positive place of miracles. And it can also be like extreme, extreme grief. And they can happen in the same day for families mm -hmm. too. Right. They call it a roller coaster for a very real reason. It's up and down. Um, so just say like, if you want to celebrate, let's do it. If you want to cry and scream, I'm here too. Mm -hmm. Whatever you yeah. Need. Yeah. I love that. I think sometimes we like when we're trying to be helpful, we want to do like those bigger gestures where I think a lot of times it is, it's the very simple of like, we're here, here's dinner, mm -hmm. you know, or, um, you know, here, like my sister needed help with her other kids, you know, so right. like my That's mom went huge. Yeah. My mom went and stayed with them for a while just to stay with her other kids. Um, so I think that, yeah, we don't have to be doing a ton, but yeah, just telling them that that we're there. Yeah, what they so. don't need are preemie clothes and preemie diapers. Um, I know that's like the, mm -hmm. the thing that people want to buy. They grow out of those so fast. And also, I feel like a lot of times parents still want to buy those for their baby. It's like it's mm -hmm. the one thing that you can do in the NICU right. is like maybe buy their first preemie outfit or something like that. So they want to keep hold on to those pieces of normalcy as much as they can and pro kind of protect them for themselves. Mm -hmm. They, they again, need that bubble and then everyone else is keeping their world going around them. So feeding, walking down childcare is really key. That's a great point because for a lot of Nikki families, this is not their first baby mm -hmm. and they have such guilt for focusing right. in on their, yeah, um, trying to juggle like life at home and the NICU. Yeah. 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 Like even even dogs it, and pet dogs care is super stressful for families because they're like, we we want to be here all the time, but we have these other responsibilities right. and it can be really hard for families, especially if they don't live very close to the NICU, which can happen often. Mm -hmm. um, like feeling like if I leave, something's going to happen. But knowing that if that is coming up, like your NICU nurses are your, are your arms and your eyes. Like we're watching your baby and we're, we're keeping them close and loved mm -hmm. on. So. And I feel like more NICUs are getting more things like the video cameras, you know, mm -hmm. so parents can, they can see the baby all the time. Like, I feel like they're getting a little bit better that way. I don't know. For sure. Like family centered care is, there's so many studies that show like the better outcomes, the more that you bring, pull the families into literally the middle of it all. Mm -hmm. Because again, that's the point like that. Oh. That is <laughs> at the end right. of the day, that's the whole point is sending a baby to a family. Um, so a lot of, a lot of NICUs are really making huge strides. Even since I started NICU nursing a decade ago, it's really the mentality and the culture is shifting pretty mm -hmm. universally, which is that's good. just makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about like, so doulas, cause even as a birth and a postpartum doula, um, I have had clients go to the NICU. So I'm trying to think of like, what, or is there anything that you can think of specifically that like birth professionals should know and maybe like some things that they can do to help support these families as well? Yeah, I think a good piece of that would be since you, uh, typically doulas already have the rapport and this are the safe space for moms so again giving them permission to debrief about their experience and doing it from a place of um support and joy and um trying to you know like no one wants to like be like a lot of times families are like, well, what if, if we had only done it this way, or if this happened, or if, 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 and so maybe just talking through those ifs and reassuring them that, yes, maybe this does not match what you wanted, and that you can be super, super sad and go through all the stages of grief about that, but knowing that your birth does not define who you're going to be as a mother. Like you are still going to be like those, those few nights that you're apart from your baby are not going to set the tone for their life. It's those thousands of nights that you're together at the end. So maybe giving them a little bit of permission to think beyond the NICU and like see the other side of it and the joy that can happen there. It's hard when they're in the moment to do that, 
but the doulas especially are the safe people. And the other piece of the NICU that are always forgotten are the partners because mm. the baby is tur- shifts. It goes from the laboring mother being the priority to the baby. And then the laboring mother is still getting the attention. Even in the NICU as a provider, we're like, mom, mom, baby. And then, okay, partner, like you chill in the corner. But they, in the reality, they often saw their partner and their baby struggling in the delivery. Or they maybe don't have anybody in their life to talk to about or process it with, or even just like say what happened to them. Um, And I, I see that that, of long term can sometimes manifest in a lot of um anxiety like long term anxiety in dads too because mm-hmm. they just never had the ability to to speak about it so saving lots of space for the partner um and giving them that permission to to mm-hmm. share their experience can be huge and then being that like kind of bridge to reminding mom like and dad about what things they can still do as a parent um and giving them that those kind of like this is what we had talked about before let's see if this is something we can do in the NICU mm-hmm. um let's just yeah, I it. always encourage dads to like you can do skin to skin too like 100%. you know or if they can be involved in helping feed the baby or yes like absolutely yeah and the, for whatever reason a lot of dads and partners that have a um a lot of just like a general medical anxiety and like at baseline um Mm -hmm. so need like a lot of extra support and encouragement that they a lot of them are like no I'll hold the baby when they're done with the NICU and they're like well that could be a while like no (laughs) you are getting you out this is your baby and they need you they don't need me I mean they need me to do the basic stuff but they need you to to be that person that they love on um and then as much as you can, if breastfeeding is the goal, like working with mom on establishing that early pumping mm-hmm. is huge and yeah. effective, like kind of getting that colostrum. And we can do, even if it's drops, we do oral care with the babies with the colostrum. So we'll put it on mm-hmm. like a swab and kind of do like a gentle um, oral stem. I actually, that was a question that. that popped into my head earlier that I forgot mm-hmm. was like, like your thoughts on like so many people now are like storing colostrum and stuff. Like, do you have thoughts about that? storing colostrum Mm -hmm. um I think I feel like as long as you're doing it within the appropriate time frame of your pregnancy because as we know like nipple stimulation can sometimes trigger Mm -hmm. labor so we don't want any Nikki babies from aggressively collecting your colostrum (laughs) I don't think that I've never I've never experienced that way like I've never had that be the reason but I guess it could be if you're really going to town but that would be amazing like to be like no actually I have this stash of breast milk and we we already like you have that low blood sugar we don't need formula like we don't need donor milk I've got my own like sash of colostrum which would be Mm -hmm. huge um yeah I think especially like if you know beforehand you know like Mm -hmm. I think especially like if a mom has gestational diabetes or something like Mm -hmm. we know that they're going to be monitoring baby's blood sugar so maybe in those cases where you know there's a chance that it might be something good to do that is such a cool idea. I wouldn't have ever really like put those two, especially with that type of a diagnosis where you're like, your baby is going to get frequent blood glucose checks because they mm-hmm. are at that high risk of that like neonatal right. sugar drop. Yeah. And it can be scary. And if we can avoid it, yeah. Yeah. awesome. Come in with, yeah. your, with your supplies. Um, hospitals are definitely like when you are administering breast milk, we treat it like a medication in that it is like super like making sure you're getting the right milk to the right baby. Uh-huh. So if you are bringing in colostrum, doing it in a way that can be labeled and stored properly in a hospital is right. really helpful. Like bags are not, I mean, it's colostrum, so you're probably going to get those little tubes, but bags are not very hospital friendly. Like hard plastic bottles are the... Mm-hmm safest way to store them. So that's yeah. a good, good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. So, I think um, I had one mom too. She was like, it was super helpful to have somebody that could show her how to hand express. Yeah. Um, Cause she's like, the pump is great, but she's like, sometimes you can get so much more, especially at the end of a feeding with hand expression. Yeah. So I think using those especially if you're separated from your baby using those like scent claws to kind of like set the stage for um having that kind of experience most NICUs have hospital grade pumps that are mm-hmm. pretty effective but also especially if you're 
separated. Like I've had moms have a hard time in those first days. Like they're, they're moving into like a hotel room or the Ronald McDonald house and they're like, I don't have a pump. So also having like just like a manual pump could also be and knowing how to use it. So you don't always mm -hmm. have to like be completely setting everything up. Mm -hmm. um, you just have that. But hand expressing, that would be those just no, those baseline skills again. So you can just like put them into action and mm -hmm. not have to sit there and yeah. you know, be thinking about it all yeah. the time. Yeah. What about um, like postpartum? So let's maybe say babies transition to home. Um, like kind of maybe talk us through that, some of the challenges that that, is and then maybe like you know maybe if they have a postpartum doula coming in what they can do sure so a big reason for admission to a NICU is breathing but a big reason that babies stay for longer are establishing feeding um, especially for premature babies that suck swallow breathe reflex doesn't really kick in until like 30 to 34 weeks. And so if your baby was born before then, they will know how to suck. They may know how to swallow. Those reflexes are there, but combining those three things together can be like very chaotic for them. And they may suck, 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 forget to breathe, cough, sputter, desat, or they may not know what to do with the bottle in their mouth and be like, I don't get it. Um, so it's, it's funny, like preemies and Nikki babies who maybe had a harder start and have those like that baseline cortisol kind of running through their body, that instinct to feed is suppressed. So they basically have to relearn that skill. It's like, like baby rehab, <laughs> learning how to eat. So going home with, to, for a baby to go home, they have to be taking all of their feeds by breast or bottle and gaining weight, maintaining their temperature and not having any, what we call apnea or bradycardia spells, which are fairly common in a baby. It's breath holding that then causes their heart rate and their oxygen levels to drop. So most ba babies are clear to do that, but sometimes it's just cleared within a day or two and then they're off home. So the big things will be helping to support a positive positive feeding experience, the NICU is really hyper-focused and we're trying to get away from it, but it's still there on volume. So like you need to take 33 milliliters every three hours and that's like appropriate for you. But at home, families still sometimes get stuck, even though we tell them like, okay, now you can kind of like feed on demand, um, get stuck in this like really rigid volume driven, um, mm -hmm. hyper-vigilant. And then you don't have that like backup support of a NICU nurse or a speech pathologist who are the feeding specialists in the NICU to guide you. So if you, as a postpartum doula that is going to be working with post-NICU families, having like a basic understanding of how babies are fed in the NICU could be super helpful. So there's a lot of resources for that. The basics of it are paste feeding, sideline paste feeding with a slow flow nipple. Um, but there's a whole program called infant driven feeding that a lot of NICUs are implementing that you can just, it's a course that you can have a license for, but living within that world can be super helpful, especially when you're communicating with families and using the same language that they heard in the NICU so that they can maintain that same type of feeding plan um, and kind of transition to like away mm -hmm. from the strictness, but keeping the like protected safe feeding times because some preemies if you feed them, if you force feed them, feed them when they're not queuing, they can eventually associate feeding with fight or flight and mm -hmm. be like, they're either going to fight it and say like, I don't want to eat anymore, or they're going to, they're going to like flight. So they'll just fall asleep and pretend like they don't know what they're doing anymore. <laughs> and that can right. set them up for long-term feeding issues, not just right. in that moment. So supporting families to keep the feeding positive, calming, mm -hmm. relaxing. I it's kind of a joke, but it isn't really that babies and dogs are very similar, that they can read your body language and your confidence levels. Mm -hmm. So fake it till you make it. Like pretend like we got this, nothing's wrong. Like this is not stressful to me, even though on the side you're like, okay, just need a little more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but just kind of like keeping it chill, keeping it positive and knowing that like it's going to be okay. Like, even if your baby gets down on one feed, they'll make it back up. And if they don't, there's people mm -hmm. that can help you with that. Like it's, right. it's going to be okay. Right. So that's a, that's a huge piece of it. And just managing general health anxiety. A lot of families, because unlike, I mean, any mother 
will always be worried about their baby. But Nikki family saw their baby struggle. Like their worst nightmare kind of happened to them. Right. So they often doubt their own gut feelings about things or maybe like hyper focus on certain things too so just kind of giving mm -hmm. family space to kind of talk through what they're feeling and what they're seeing related to their babies um what's going on with them and kind of giving them space for that too and also knowing that preemies are and nikki babies in, in general are notorious for having mild to moderate to even severe reflux like that's yeah. very common mm -hmm. um and preparing families for for that and it's not necessarily something that they can just live with like it there are many right. different layers of it but knowing like kind of talking them through like what's normal what's a spit up versus what is something we need to like maybe talk to your to your right. medical team about yeah, but they're noisy. Preemies are noisy. They're always grunting mm -hmm. and groaning. And <laughs> their nervous system isn't, it's just, it's still, even if they're term, it's still slightly immature. So things that feel normal to a normal baby, they're going to feel even weirder to a baby. Like in a, a preemie does not like to be stroked. It's very like stimulating and negatively. They like firm containment. Mm -hmm. So they like, they think they're still in there. <clears throat> <laughs> they want yeah they want that they don't want to be like the light touch they want that firm yeah. nestled feeling it's the same thing when they're having like a gas pain it may feel extra intense to a preemie so they're going to be vocal mm -hmm. about it and kind of kind of talk yeah, for it makes sense but yeah absolutely they get there they always do <laughs> yeah <laughs> Awesome. This has been so informative. I'm going to have to like go back and take notes and like listen <laughs> again, because I feel like I've learned so much just like about the experience and about how I can help my clients and about how I can even help my family and friends. And yeah. this has been wonderful. I really am. Yeah. I've been it's like, it's not, I'm like, I tend to like try to do too much at once, but one of my, within the next calendar year goals is to do like a doula training, like the CEUs mm -hmm. so that like basically like make you one on ones. Yeah, and I like think that's boot great. Camp and things like that, so that you all have those tools at yeah. your at your fingertips, basically yeah. to like really. Yeah, hone that would be awesome. Out. I think a lot of our doulas would love that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Because we do. We all. I'm like, I can think of so many off the top of my head that I'm like, I know they've had clients with NICU babies, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's just it's kind of not like an if, it's kind of a when, mm -hmm. like. So and um, it's and it's for different reasons too, but the right general there's an underlying theme of many NICU babies and what they mm -hmm. experience in the unit and then how they transition home also. Right. Yeah. Um, and also yeah, connecting great. NICU families with other NICU families can be really huge too if they're ready for it. They're not always ready for it. Um to help have someone that can be like just talk through what mm -hmm. they happen, what mm -hmm. happened to them and feel like, oh, like, oh. You did, you did it too. Like you're my safe person to talk to about that. Right. Yeah. That's what we really encourage all of our doulas to like know the resources in their area mm -hmm. to like, so that they can help families kind of get connected with people that can support them. So yeah, that's great. Is your awesome. community, your support community, mostly based on Facebook? No. So I, it should, if I can get all my ducks in a row, it should be launching in the next three to four weeks and it's okay. going to be outside of Facebook. So because on Facebook, sometimes I feel like people, it's not, you know, you get some, some, maybe some weirdos mm -hmm. on there or yeah. you can't <laughs> feel as safe to express your feelings and your right. maybe more like sensitive information. So it's living on a separate platform. You have to have like your own separate little account to it. Um, mm -hmm. But it it's set up very similar to Facebook. So there's a feed there's, but better than Facebook, there's like forums that you can like search in. So you can yeah. like search in breastfeeding your preemie or you can search oh. into YouTube feeds or, um, you know, all the different kind of flavors of NICU experience. And then we're doing monthly calls, um, basically like a podcast where you can ask questions mm -hmm. to an expert. So we're having like a lactation consultant come in. We're having a, some NICU moms awesome. come in and talk about their experience and then yeah. having like some just more like learning in addition to mm -hmm. community. So if people are interested in that, there's a wait list you can join on my website. Um, That's what I was going to say. I was like, well, where can people find this? Yes. <laughs> so we'll, um, I'll get links from you and we'll make sure we include sure. links and stuff yeah, here and for everybody. Yeah, but and it's not just <laughs> for NICU family. It's going to be like, if you are a person who cares for NICU people or have NICU 
families in your life, I feel like it can still be a good resource to mm -hmm. kind of um, learn from both people who have experienced it and then other professionals who can help kind of right. just build your knowledge bank for how to help yep. support babies and thrive at home. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Well, this was so great. Thanks so much for of being course. on here. I'm so yes, glad that we you. got connected. So we will We'll have to keep in touch. And when you can Absolutely. get that doula training ready, or if we can help you with that, please like reach out. It'll be, yeah, it'll I'd be love great to do that. So, well, thank you awesome. so much for having me on. Thanks this was so, so fun. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, If anybody that's listening has any questions, feel free to like send them to us and we'll send them over to Mary and maybe we can get them answered and stuff. So, all right. Thanks everyone. Stay tuned. We'll talk to you guys next week.